go ahead and record the video, then please do. I've got, well, now I see the word recording anyway, <laughs> so that's okay for that. Okay, so hello everybody, good evening, um, and welcome to this workshop on upskilling for the future of communications, presented by Africa Comms Week, ACW, and the Chartered Institute of Public Relations, CIPR. My name is Enyola Harrison, and I'm a co-founder of Africa Comes Week. I'm also a communications consultant working with corporate and institutional clients. Uh, and it's really a pleasure to have um, so many of you all here today. So I'm just going to share a little bit of background about ACW, Africa Comes Week. Um, we're a network of Africa-focused communication professionals passionate about the continent's transformation. And each year, Africa Comes Week hosts a series of events around Africa Day, to encourage Africa-focused comms professionals around the world, connect, engage, um, and impact the continent's transformation through strategic comms. Managing reputation and changing perceptions about the continent is a really important part um, of this trans transformation. And we really believe, we strongly believe that comms professionals such as ourselves have the tools and resources to impact the continent's trajectory through our work, through the work that we do. And that's part of the reason why we're here um, today. So to think and to plan for how to equip ourselves with the resources and tools we need for the future. Because as we know, the landscape is changing and this change is driven by technology. So our industry is one of the most dynamic ones um, and coupled with the massive impact that the pandemic is having on the future of work in general, this is really an opportune moment, uh, I think, for us to start thinking about professional development and the skills and areas of expertise we need to develop to stay relevant for the future. And now I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Annie, who is going to talk and share a little bit about um, some thoughts on skills for the future. Hello everyone, my name is Annie Mutamba. I'm the co-founder of Africa Communications Week and uh, the owner of a public affairs consulting firm specializing in government relations between Africa and Europe and based in Brussels. As Anyana just said, Africa Comes Week was built on the belief that there's a very obvious link between strategic communication and socioeconomic development an obvious link that no one talks about, and that communication professionals can also play a huge role in Africa's economic transformation. And when I say communication professionals, I mean those in Africa, but also those outside the continent, because there are so many voices and organizations out there that have a massive and sometimes negative impact on how Africa and Africans are perceived. And I'm sure I don't need to give you examples where when when we launched Africa Comes Week in 2017, our mission was clear. The communication professions can play a role in Africa's development, but when empowered uh, with the right skills, the right networks and professional development opportunities. And um, it actually reflects the main feedback we got when we launched the first edition back uh, three years ago. So hosting this workshop is just natural for us and we're very glad to join forces with CIPR because the potential is huge. But before we hand over to our CIPR colleagues here, um, this workshop is really about upskilling. So we thought it would be helpful to take a look at some of the skills that will be relevant and in high demand in, in the future. So we'd like to present you with a top 10. Uh, we call them the power skills. And you'll I don't know if you can show the, the slide now uh, where we present them in no particular order. Do you see the slide? Because I don't. Yes. Yes? Oh, okay, good. Uh, the first one is cross-cultural communication. Um, for Africa-focused communication professionals, for those of us, who work across different countries and regions, cross-cultural communication is the absolute must. Uh, you could be working at an agency, in a company, uh, an institution, uh, the government level, an NGO, an international organization. It is crucial to understand and be able to communicate and um, 
well, yes, to translate the practical realities uh, at the local level because, and we all know this, but there's no such thing as communicating Africa as a single market. And I'm not even talking about the Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone language divide, which means we're sometimes losing out actually on opportunities. All eyes today are on Africa, so now is the time to step up. The second scale, well, second area, reputation management. Well, whether you want to build it, manage it, restore it, reputation is an organization's most valuable asset. It's a, so to speak, license to operate. Uh, we all remember the Ethiopian airline crash in March 2019, and I know it feels like ages ago now, but it really put Boeing's reputation on the line. On the other hand, Ethiopian Airlines, if you remember, would be in deep trouble right now if it wasn't for solid reputation and issue management. And that directly impacts its bottom line. So reputation is definitely something we need to master. Same as ethics, as a profession, there are so many lessons we can draw from the current health crisis. And one of them is our potential to affect lives and influence economies. This is power and it comes with a lot of responsibilities. Honesty, trust, accuracy, uh, diversity, free speech, and so on. Those ethical standards should be reflected in everything we do and say. Uh, this is another area where we, as Africa-focused communication professionals, collectively need to, uh, to succeed. Risk and crisis communication, I'm sure I don't need to insist on that one. The importance of this discipline has been widely acknowledged and praised, especially over the last month. Um, and it's here to stay. Uh, it's a strategic field for any organization in the world and definitely in all our countries across the African continent. And then public affairs, and that's my last point before I hand over back to you, Eniola, as a public affairs consultant myself, I feel compelled to talk about it. Depending on how you see it narrowly or broadly, public affairs is mostly a combination of government relations, public policy, um, issue management, and strategic communication helping your organization communicate effectively with government is going to become increasingly, increasingly important in the future. Whether you want to influence, to position your organization as a solution provider, to monitor what comes next, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that is valid for any public policy at the local, national, regional, or international level. Now for the rest of the list, I'm handing over to you, Eniola. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> so thanks, Annie. Uh, just to, so the next item on the list is planning and budget management. And I mean, I think, you know, we all know as PR and communication professionals that strategic planning, you know, um, in PR is what really sets the profession apart, you know, as a critical component of building a business and managing reputation. So this is definitely, I mean, I think that investing a lot of time and resources in upskilling in planning and resource management is absolutely crucial um, for the future. One of my favorite, I would say, um, areas uh, to talk about is actually digital communication. And I mean, I think that if there's one thing that the pandemic has you know, brought to the fore, it's the need for all PR professionals to be skilled in digital communication and to understand the creative, technical and strategic components of online communication as well. So we're all going to need to become digitally inclined professionals, um, understanding um, existing and emerging social media platforms, data analytics, visual communication and content creation. Um, how these fit together, how paid and organic social media works um, with paid search, content marketing analytics, all of, all of these elements are absolutely crucial for uh, the future of communication and definitely an area to, to focus on. And this naturally leads me to uh, data-driven communication, um, which is crucial. How prepared are we you know, with data to make decisions? As PR professionals, it's our job to understand what drives our clients' businesses and to make recommendations that are best for them. And this is best done using data and insights. And so this means that we need to become really well versed in analytics, as well as apply, a, you know, a level of scientific rigor to our to our PR planning as well. 
Another point, you know, on this is that we are experiencing a lot of, I would say, data shock. So there's an overload of data these days with hundreds of thousands of stories, press releases, flooding the ecosystem. And we really need data and insights to help us rise above the noise, you know, to help us to get our messages across. And so, you know, making informed decisions based on this data and research will really help us to unearth these new insights um, and story hooks that will transform a, a good story into a really great one. Next um, is AI and the potential of AI. And, you know, the CIPR has just released um, a new ethics guide for PR professional. I think we'll talk about this later, but honestly, CIPR has, has some really amazing resources and AI and PR um, have done really, really good work on this. So I really recommend um, you to check out their resources um, in this area. Um, but we really need as PR professionals to understand the basics of AI. So, you know, machine learning, neural networks, um, how algorithms work, and also how AI is actually impacting the work that we do. Um, one, of the, one of the studies that was done um, by, by CIPR shows that, you know, quite a significant amount of the work that PR professionals do is being and will be replaced by AI tools in five years. Um, so this is, you know, this is really something um, to think about. It's also impacting, you know, for example, it's changing news and journalism, right? Um, and, how, and this will affect media relations practice. So the birth of AI powered content generation in the newsroom will change how we pitch and how we do our jobs. And finally, I think is the business of media. So, you know, we will need to understand how media is evolving, how media is changing and how media actually works. You know, what is, you know, what, what is the bottom line? Who are the interests? What drives content? Um, this is really, really interesting for us to be able to understand how to position our messages, to get our messages um, out there, and to really understand what's driving the media revolution in the future. So um, just before we move on, I have a quick, we have a quick poll um, just to run uh, for, for everybody. And I'm just going to launch the poll now. And the first question is really, you know, do you follow a structured development plan? Is this something that you do? And then out of these 10 power skills or areas of expertise, which one do you, you need to spend the most time developing? So just give you about a minute. So I'm just going to stop the poll now. I think we have, uh, oh, people are still voting. <laughs> All right. So it's interesting to see that we're, we're, it's kind of an even split, it seems, <laughs> in how many people are following a structured development plan and interesting to see that uh, most people are need to upskill in the area of digital communication and the potential of AI. But to sum it all up, you know, this, um, the future of comms is actually multi-skilled. Um, I actually, I have a colleague who once told me that we need to multi-skill or die as, as, com as communication professionals. But a commitment to continuous professional development is a must. And this is one of the reasons I think CIPR is so important. And here to give us um, an, uh, an overview and introduction to CIPR is CIPR International Chair, Andres Stanislav. So Andres, over to you. Hello everyone and welcome and, and thanks for joining this webinar. Um, uh, my name is Andres Stanislav and I'm the acting chair of the CIPR International Group, uh, which is among the biggest group, the largest group within the CIPR. Uh, we have around thousand members I think we have a slide with, with exact figures um, in the slideshow. Uh, but as far as I remember, we have 979 uh, according to the latest stats. Um, around 35-40% of them are based outside the UK. Um, so it basically, in terms of the membership, we have two 
Um, the one which is still a majority are the members who are working within the United Kingdom, uh, but working in inter international roles. So they're particularly interested in, in um, cross-cultural communication, uh, digital communication, and all like social media, global communications. Uh, but also we have a nice amount of, of uh, members who are based outside the UK. Uh, I'm actually based in Hungary, so it's not that far from the United Kingdom. Uh, but we have members from South Africa, but even from New Zealand and Australia, which is quite far from, um, uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, so the, the, the needs of those, those members are slightly different because they are not always working at international roles, uh, but they want to learn the, uh, the experience and the best practices of what is basically a general practice in the UK or in the US market. Um, so we have as a group, uh, we have these roles of serving both the members who are based in the UK, but the members who are based outside the UK. Um, what we as a group usually do for and did for, for the UK members, uh, again, before COVID uh, and before the lockdowns, uh, we did lots of events, uh, live events, mainly in, the, in, in London, um, mostly networking, networking, but also uh, like panel discussions and some, and some uh, skills learning as well. Um, and also we did a webinar series, which is, which is basically available for everyone, especially nowadays, uh, since it's, it's digital and it's available through our uh, website channel. Uh, but with, what we did for the non-UK members for ages, uh, we're basically lobbying for uh, the CIPR to get as many sources as possible to digital, to the digital scene. Um, so basically the Influence magazine, which was a printed magazine of the CIPR, it did uh, went digital, so now it's available for all members all over the world. Uh, now, uh, since COVID and since the lockdown, the chartership assessment is, uh, is available online. So I'm quite proud that approximately 8.5, 8.6% of our membership is already chartered, which is a huge achievement uh, because all around the world there are uh, approximately 350 chartered practitioners, which is basically the highest qualification and highest recognition of, the, uh, of our profession. And that chartership is, is recognized by the CIPR. And also, it's the latest news, but Mandy, uh, who is the president-elect of the CIPR, of the overall CIPR, uh, will tell, we might be able to tell a bit more details about the training sessions because they, they the, most of the trainings were uh, uh, offline uh, and available in UK cities, but now most of them and, and, and more and more are getting available online. So people who are based outside the UK are available to, uh, to access that. In terms of the channels, what we use, uh, you can reach us to, um, uh, via our LinkedIn channel, we have a Twitter channel, we have a Facebook uh, channel and a LinkedIn group as well. And also we have a website, which is ciprinternational.com. And we have a blog site uh, where we post lots of uh, blog posts from mainly uh, overseas members. And what else do we have? And we have a video channel as well, where all the podcasts and the uh, videos, the UNPR webinar series are available. So that's in a nutshell, that's what CIPR International is, is, is about. And uh, at a later stage, I'm very happy to, to answer all your specific questions regarding how the CIPR International works and what is the company doing uh, or how can we at your service in a way. So thanks, thanks again for this interaction. Thanks so much, Andras. Um, and now we're going to hear from Dar Bruni. <laughs> Hi, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Yes, we can, yes. Hi, um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes just to talk about, you know, why um, African PR practitioners should actually join the CIPR. Um, I won't go so in depth with uh, my background. I still have an opportunity to speak a little bit about that later on um, in our conversation today. Um, but I'll just like to say that um, I'm Nigerian. Uh, my full name is Darbuni Hai Mikori. Um, I'm from Nigeria, West Africa, based in Nigeria, and I'm also probably a CIP member. Um, I've been a member since 2007 and recently um, became a chattered um, PR practitioner, um, which I hold very proudly. 
and um, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm speaking to you today on this panel. Um, in terms of why CIPR, there's so many reasons, but you know, um, as a PR practitioner, um, we manage relationships, we manage narratives between not just um, people, but also organizations and also the community. And part of our role and our job is to be positive influencers and also motivators, not just to boards and not just to our clients, but also directly to our society and our community as well. Um, and as Africans, um, telling stories is really a foundation in which we've been, you know, we've grown up in. And not just for Africans, um, but also for every um, representation we have here today. Um, we can't tell, we can't let anyone else tell our stories. We're the best people that can tell our stories because we live it, we breathe it, we understand it, and it's in our blood. And um, one of the reasons why it's very important for us as Africans to be a part of CIPR is because we need a very credible background um, and a very credible platform and um, to be able to tell our stories, to be able to craft those positive narratives which aren't always out there in, in the media space or externally, but also be, to be able to have a space on the table where we can actually contribute to that conversation. And the CIPR for me has been one of those platforms in that with the upskilling, which um, Annie and Eliola have already spoken to um, so eloquently with the 10 steps they've given us already. That's all just a little part of what you can that CIPR contributes to you as a professional um, so you have an opportunity um, to have access to so many resources that support your upskilling you're also in a community of professionals where you can build on best practices share your failures and also just have conversations within professionals who are working under specific codes of conduct and ethics which um, we're all signed on to as professionals and to be able to come through that with a credible voice makes um, gives the um, credibility and also allows the the public all over the world um, to believe our stories, to understand that we're coming from a positive place. And I think that that's one of the first things as a PR professional that you want to be seen as a credible voice, an authentic voice. And that is what CIPR can support you in doing. Um, another thing, of course, as well, is our contribution to developing, albeit some faster than others, but in, uh, as Africans, um, we do know that there is a dearth in that area for all sorts of industries. And being able to come forth as a PR professional and to demonstrate that being a PR professional communicator isn't um, what many people think it is within the digital age where it's just a low barrier of entry and anybody that has a social media platform who's an influencer can hop into and suddenly they're this fantastic communicator but to be able to demonstrate that there's a difference between someone doing that and being able to go through the skills you need as CIPR, um, you know, would build our profession and, of course, automatically create jobs, um, support the, the economy, and also create the industry that we need um, to thrive in Africa. And finally, before um, I switch over, I'll also say that um, being um, a CIP professional makes you relevant. Um, and specifically working under ethical code. As we as we probably heard before, there's strength in numbers. And when you have numbers and a large group of people saying the same things, working within the same kind of code, um, you would find that there would be a strength in making those positive impacts in the society, which of course will ultimately um, support Africa in so, so many ways. And so I'll just stop there because I know our conversation is going, but I hope that um, that has touched a few key points um, to my further my fellow brothers and sisters on the call, and of course, all those who are not Africans, um, just to be inspired to be a part of this movement um, that has been here for decades and will continue to be here, hopefully, to support us professionally. Thanks, Darbuni. And so next, we're going to hear from um, CIPR President-elect Mandy Pierce. Hello, I'm really pleased to be here today and, and lovely to meet so many of you. Um, as um, I, I'm the CIPR president-elect, so that means I'm the CIPR president next year, which is um, a huge honour. Um, I'm a public sector communicator by background, but I'm also a consultant and a trainer. So as Andras says, I have a little bit of insight into um, some of CIPR's training offer as well. 
Um, I was just delighted to hear everything Darboni and our previous speakers have said because the, the challenges we all face to differentiate ourselves from anyone who just thinks they can communicate are just the same the world over. So, you know, it is just as much of a struggle for us as in, in the UK uh, as you guys out here. So um, we are united in that. And I think that point about professional differentiation, showing the value we add is so important. Um, I was absolutely passionate when I, I decided to stand to be president of the CIPR that we needed to modernize and we needed to make our resources available online so that we had more content, more training courses and chartership um, opportunities online. And, you know, there have been many difficult things uh, that have come about due to COVID, but the one positive one has been it has given us the impetus to move much perhaps more quickly than we were intending to um, so that most of our offer as CIPR is now a digital online offer and that is just so much better for our colleagues all around the world um, you know whether that's in Asia whether it's Africa Latin America um, it just makes so much more accessible so I'm delighted that you know as Andras was saying that we now have so many charter professionals amongst our international colleagues and, and well done Darboni, absolutely superb um, and it's not easy the chartership so I, I've gone through it myself only a couple of years ago so I know exactly how scary it is at whatever level you are and how, how experienced you are it's a scary thing to do. Um, one of the things we have done as well as getting our chartership online is we've put a lot more um, resources online uh, available as part of COVID. So we've put a lot of specific webinar content around crisis um, and uh, internal communications online. We've also just launched an employability hub because we know how important it is for anyone who is potentially looking at changing career at this point. Um, we are in a world of digital interviews and for people of my age that is a very scary thought um you're used to you know seeing people face to face so um the challenge of putting yourself across and getting your message across digitally is there for all of us um we've moved a lot of our training online so uh, for those of us who train like myself that was quite a, a rapid transition but it's been great fun because um, we've had to master the technology as well as delivering our content, but it's meant we can meet so many more people. So some of the courses I run, I do some of the social and digital courses, and that's been lovely to meet colleagues from all over the UK and our international colleagues joining those courses. And it's been really fun. We've been able to share um, our range of experiences. So that's been brilliant. Um, I'm, Graham, I know he's going to talk a bit more about CPD, but I would just wanted to say absolutely committed to CPD. You know, at, no matter where you are in your career, you do need to continue to learn. I'm, I'm so conscious that uh, I started my career in, in an era of fax machines and um, no internet. So, you know, I'm very aware that we have to continue to learn all the time. You have to keep refreshing those skills, learn new things, throw yourself into spaces where perhaps you don't naturally feel comfortable and and learn and give things a go and try things out and I know Kerry's somewhere on the call here um, and you know I'm still learning a lot about AI and PR and you know so I'm continually reading up so for all of us you know there is that push to keep developing our skills to be relevant in a modern industry and I loved the um, top 10 skills we were looking at earlier I thought that was absolutely spot on definitely the sort of things we should be looking at so I'm going to hand over to Graham he's going to talk you through a bit more about the uh, CPD ladder and chartership I think yeah great thank you very much uh, Mandy for that um, hello everyone I'm Graham Kench so I'm membership and CPD manager for CP CIPR um, what that means really is just making sure that everything runs as smoothly as possible for members doing their CPD, joining, renewing their membership, all of those things. Um, 
So just to let you know a little bit about, uh, there's two main reasons why people join the CIPR. We do surveys on this quite regularly. Um, and the first one is for professional development purposes. So all of the resources available through the CPD platform um, and on our website in terms of podcasts, webinars, skills guides, plus all of our training courses that are now available digitally um, address that primary need of our members to um, have professional development all the time. And the second one is networking. So the opportunity to broaden the professional network beyond just those people that you, you know or that you work with all the time um, and branch out a bit. So um, those are the two sort of practical ways that we um, enable our members to develop themselves professionally and to broaden their professional network. Um, so um, if I just take you through the online chartership assessment process, um, Darburni is going to come on in a minute and let you know about her experience from um, the assessment. Uh, but essentially, we're the only chartered professional body worldwide for PR and communications. So we're the only organisation that's an, allowed to award chartered status individually to our members, which is highly prized and, and recognised. And it demonstrates a commitment to continuously keeping your skills and knowledge up to date at all times. And of course, that's really valued by employers um, and society at large. Uh, so if I could have the next slide, please. Yep, so um, a bit more about the CPD or continuing professional development side of things. So we've got the industry's leading CPD platform. So it's an online digital platform that's available um, when you log in as a member of the CIPR. We've refreshed it a little bit, given it a bit of a facelift for this year to make it a bit more user friendly. It's now linked to our central database so we can see which training courses you've been on with us and make sure you don't have to double enter information every time. Um, there's over 1,800 learning resources on there, and as I said before, lots of webinars, podcasts, skills guides, and it's all about you being able to log and track the development activity that you're doing. Um, so it's a recording system as well as a gateway to all of that information. So every time you look at a piece of information, user resource, um, you can enter a reflective statement to talk about what you've gained from that piece of knowledge and how your practice will change as a result. And that will log against your personal learning cloud um, towards your um, allocated points for that year. So if we could have the next slide. Uh, yeah, so we've introduced, um, as Mandy alluded to earlier, for, because of coronavirus, we've, we've been doing even more than usual for our members. Um, and we've laid on some on-demand courses, which have been uh, very kindly provided by CIPR's expert trainers to help members through this time. So um, there's, there's 10 plus uh, what we call CIPR Learn webinars covering everything really from managing teams during lockdown, change communication, um, internal communications and how that will change if you're managing people remotely so there's absolutely loads of resources available even more than usual um, on our website as a member and all of that's really timely uh, for the situation that we're in now the next slide so practically speaking how does cpd work with the cipr so as a member you gain access to cpd it comes as part of the membership package the CPD cycle runs from the beginning of March every year to the end of February, last day of February. And each member who's participating is asked to collect 60 points each year. Um, to give you a rough indication, one webinar or skills guide is typically worth five points. So that's kind of the magnitude of the points value and how quickly those can add up. Um, every member needs to collect at least five points from an ethics topic, and that's because ethics is a compulsory subject, um, because we're a chartered professional body and, of, and the importance of it. Um, and most activities, in fact, will give you five points. So we're talking about roughly 12 activities per cycle, if they're all very short, kind of uh, looking at a webinar, listening to a podcast sort of thing. It's worth mentioning some activities give you more and in some cases far more than five points depending on what the activity is so if you're studying for a qualification for example that's a, um, a very hefty amount of work and a big commitment so we recognize that 
with a higher points value that's allocated. Up to 60 in some cases are allocated for qualifications. And on to the next slide. Yeah, and so we've got a here's a here's a very fairly easy to understand um, image to show you the process for getting chartered and holding on to your chartered status once you've got it. So there's three components really. Um, the first one is about commitment to ongoing CPD. So if you're looking to become chartered, you just need to demonstrate that you've been doing CPD in some shape or form for at least the past three years. That may be with the CIPR or it could be elsewhere. Um, you need to be um, a member of the CIPR at full member grade at the time you sit your chartered assessment and you need to remain at that grade if you want to hold on to your chartered status. And the third component is you need to pass the chartered assessment, um, which is a practical hands on full day chartered assessment, um, which is now available virtually for the first time and that's working really well. Um, and so to tell you a little bit about how the virtual chartered assessment works. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Darbuni, who can perhaps give us some personal insights into how that worked for her. Yeah, so hi, I'm back again, Darbuni again. Um, so um, basically, I'm just going to take you through um, a very short story, which is my, my career journey. Uh, it won't be too long. Um, and I've also built what I call the 10 C's to get in chattered so I guess um, Annie and Enola were in the spirit <laughs> with the number 10 and I'm just hoping that it'll really you know give us some you know and um, and be, be chattered as well and so I had a very vast career that covers you know um, very professions I'm a trained graphic public relations practitioner as well and I've been um, working um, professionally for over 20 years. And one thing that has remained constant um, over the 20 years of my career is the, the word transition. I've always been in a state of transition. And um, one thing that always um, shows up just before I move on to the next level in my transition over the 20 years um, has been a comfort zone. I've always, I had to identify that I was in some kind of comfort zone and I had to realize that um, even though I was comfortable in that space for various reasons, um, I may have been good, I may have been great, but I had to get better so I could move to the next level. And so to get better for me, um, the first thing I had to do was to humble myself, forget all my past laurels and all my past successes and really hard I think for all of us is also to forget my failures as well and humbling myself was really important to really develop that learner's mindset to understand that there's something better there's something I need to improve on on myself and really being open to change and being curious about that change and also you know being courageous enough to take the kind of risks and also you know make the kind of different difficult choices that we have to make you know as we make those sort of um, uh, changes in our lives for me, um, I'm, I'm a mom as well as a professional. And so some of those choices go far beyond just individual um, success or individual progress, but also things that have to, be, have to do with the collective that is outside of me. And so that's where um, the issue of courage and the issue of taking risks was really important because you're actually putting other people's lives you know, on, on the line as you develop as well. And so in 2005, 2006, um, I met Dr. Ismail Ibrahim and he introduced me to uh, the then International Public Re um, Institute of Public Relations, which is now the Chattered Institute of Public Relations. And soon after that, you know, I enrolled to um, do the CIPR diploma, the postgraduate diploma. And for me, that was a shift from, um, I was then in the hospitality industry as a graphic designer, little, doing a little bit of client uh, relations, but I. I really wanted to go into core PR. So for me, that was the major step taking the diploma. And so even a lot of things in life was happening. Fourth cycle of the CPD, which is the continuous development program. And I don't regret any minute of my journey. So some of you, apart from probably doing the math, trying to figure out how old I am, I'm still young, <laughs> by the way, um, you probably are wondering um, 13 years, why did you wait 13 years 
before you went into chatterchip you know why did you take that long and i think the first thing i would say and my defensive you know communications response would be actually cpd and and the chatter um, and the opportunity to become chattered only came in like six or seven or eight years ago. So it wasn't 13 years. Um, but the honest part of me would just say, say really it was the fear of failure. I had um, the whole idea of being chattered and the need to be chattered smiling at me off my vision board for two solid years. I would see the word chattered and I'll just tick up the boxes and I'll look at it again. I was like, is it too late for me to tear that down my vision board? But I guess it's too late because it's there. And um, because of the opportunity that we that we had and we thank CIPR, Mandy and and the team that's there now for really opening up the opportunity of having the online assessment, because that, you know, sort of like cut off some of the excuses I had, which was, you know, paying for a ticket, going and getting a hotel, getting time off work. But then now work is at home, no hotels, no tickets, you know, Darvini, just do it. And, you know, I finally did do it and, um, and um, I really don't regret doing it at all. I had to build the courage to, I had to be committed um, and I had to set myself to be the, to, to a date and being committed me meant that I had to pay because real, real commitment means when money is coming out, right? And so <laughs> when I paid, I knew it was locked in. This was a matter of pounds and naira and dollars and cents. And so, you know, I have to show up. Whatever happens, I'm going to show up so that, you know, this money makes sense. Um, so I read the book, the Get Chattered Handbook, two versions of it, um, and then also watched the webinars, um, did the homework. And, you know, here I am today. Um, one of the few that Andres, you know, has, has so proudly mentioned, a part of Africa, and I understand I'm actually the only one based in Nigeria that is chartered, but a very little part of the little percentage that is the African part, which I'm really proud of and thankful to everyone that has brought me this far. So um, just to recap, you know, just to say that um, it's definitely something we should all do as professionals, irrespective of where we come from. And I promised you 10 C's, which I hope is going to wrap this up very nicely and help you really understand the journey. And the first is um, the 10 C's for me getting chatted. The first was recognize your comfort zone. And you'll see that's the C. Just look out for the C. I don't have a slide, so look out for the C's and what I'm saying. So the first is recognize your comfort zone. The second is be open and embrace change. The third is stay curious. We are in a dynamic world. You have to stay curious so that you're up to date and up to par with all the changes, not only in our industry, but in the world to stay relevant. Number four is you have to find courage, find courage within yourself, um, overcome your fears. Number five is to be confident, be confident in your own expertise, in your own ability, in the value that you bring into the conversations, irrespective of your background. Um, number six is connect. One of the main things and ways for you to connect and well and work is by meeting people and that is exactly what the chattered institute of public relations does it allows us to connect not locally but internationally and globally and really you know feed off of those networks to make a greater impact which i hope is why we're all uh, pr professionals number seven is to enroll and commit with money to uh, the cpd because you're going to need to be paying your membership fees and then of course for it to have value in you you have to enroll and become a part of the cycle for the continuous pro um, professional development which can help you in various themes across whatever jobs or industries you support or work for and then number eight is get chattered um, uh, which is really important because i think that's the highest and then number nine is to obtain credibility credibility which i spoke of initially as being an African in the PR space and the credibility of being chattered, bringing that into the boardroom and reaping from the benefits of that individually and for the industry as well. And finally, number 10, you become conspicuous. You become um, a, a visible PR practitioner. I wanna thank Graham and Samantha, um, you know, who invited me to this platform, um, an opportunity which I probably wouldn't have gotten if I didn't you know, take the courage and go out there and actually get chattered and I'm really proud to do so and really happy to be able to share my journey. And I hope that this would inspire everyone listening to do the same. Thanks. Thanks, Darbuni. <laughs> Thanks so much. And so, Graham, are you going to um, continue with this? Yes, I can do. Yeah. So, um... So the chartered assessment itself, it's a one day format. 
Um, and the assessment is on three key areas, which are ethics, strategy, and leadership. And as you can see there, those are broken down further into sub-component parts. Um, you'll see a little photograph on the screen there of one of our recent virtual chartered assessment days. Um, and we found that that format works really well. Um, you know, it's available wherever you are, um, but the conversations that need to be held to assess you can still be held really effectively um, virtually. So could we have the next slide, please? Yeah, so effectively the benefits of being chartered um, are, it means you can stand toe to toe with chartered professionals working in other sectors. So if you're working in your companies with chartered accountants or chartered engineers or others, then you are literally on the same level as, as them. Um, the recognition is the same. Um, but more importantly than that, um, it's going to improve the boardroom perception of PR and communications. Um, it is a strategic management function and more and more that's being recognised through more of our members becoming chartered. So you're doing something for yourself, but you're also doing something for the profession by being chartered. And the next slide. So uh, member groups and networking. Um, I don't know, Samantha, do you want to give us some uh, insights in this area? Yes, thank you very much, Graham, and thank you to everyone this evening for joining us. Uh, so my name is Samantha Siwusaran. I'm based in Mauritius. Um, I have a background in government and corporate communications, and I run a Pan-African news portal uh, by the name of PlatformAfrica.com, which aims to showcase what Africa can do for the world. And we're also a media partner of Africa Communications Week. Um, and so in terms of CIPR, I'm actually a member of the CIPR International Committee, along with Andras. And I'm also the founder of the CIPR network in Mauritius. So I'm really working with CIPR to try and build our Pan-African network because I think it, believe it can bring tremendous value, just as Darbuni has been saying a few minutes ago. Um, the reason why I've chosen this slide, which shows a number of ladies and one holding a microphone, um, is that this is our first real success story in Mauritius that we had our launch events last year. Um, the lady shown in the picture with the microphone is Marie Noel, who may be with us this evening, I'm sure she'll pop up if she is, um, who became our first Mauritian PR professional uh, who got chartered last week. Um, and I know that there are a number of others recently, also Tarzima from Botswana, who may be with us. So I think that already, just in the last few weeks, we've done tremendously well in getting more chartered practitioners in Africa, um, which I think is absolutely wonderful. So congratulations to all of them. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please, Iola. So in, in terms of member groups, that uh, CIPR does have a wide range of member groups on different topics. Um, so if you do join, either as a member or a global affiliate, which Graham will explain shortly, uh, that you do have the chance to be part of CIPR International. You can contribute, for example, to its blog. Uh, you can get in touch with other international members. Uh, but if you want to do other things as well, if you have specific sectoral interests, uh, such as myself, I have a background on the sort of corporate and financial side, so I'm also happy to follow that sector group. Um, overall, there are a wide range of different topic areas where you can also look for online um, and international networking opportunities in, uh, you know, across, across the globe, really. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide. So this is networking. Um, so myself, I thought it would be a good idea to, uh, to set up my own network in Mauritius because I was very much convinced it would bring value uh, to PR professionals in the country. So, uh, so the first picture here shows myself at the top. Uh, hello. Oh, sorry, I'll just carry on. So, uh, so yes, so the first picture then shows our networking event where we had around 60 people um, who came last March. And so for anyone that would be interested in setting up their own events in the country, then I would be very happy to, uh, to explain how that is done. Um, I think I can see Marie Noel, so thanks for joining us. Um, the second photo is one from the Mauritius Africa Fintech Hub, where we also had an event uh, which was taken place last year. So this was the plan, the Africa Fintech Festival. So in Mauritius, we're very excited about fintech. I have uh, you know, many, many fintech interests. And, and I think what's exciting here, and when we look at upskilling as well, is that all of this upskilling and networking goes hand in hand, particularly in the areas of real innovation. Um, so the way I see it is to say that, uh, you know, if we can take all, all PR professionals together in a particular country or in a particular sector, like take everyone with us and then we'll be able to acquire the skills and the knowledge that we need to go forward. Um, I mean, I think if we can all work out, you know, how am I going to tell my part of the African story? 
on my part would be, you know, here we are in Mauritius, we're very active in fintech, we're, you know, we're trying to be, be a leading role in financial services and so on. So I, mean, I think with the upskilling of all of the different, uh, different tools and the knowledge that we can learn from CIPR, that this really gives us an opportunity to come together. Um, and if we can really upskill PR professionals across the continents, from, you know, from all different parts and across sectors, I mean, this is how we're going to tell the story of Africa as a dynamic and thriving and innovative, innovative continent that we really know it is. So, so I think that's, that's why I'm excited about the opportunities to do more in Africa. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount to do and there are so many talented professionals out there that if we can all come together in CIPR, then, um, then I think we have an amazing future ahead of us. Uh, so we can carry on to the next slide. Um, so now coming on to thought leadership, yes, we'll just move on here. I um, mean, this was briefly mentioned by Enyoda at the beginning that, um, that in the area of AI and PR and ethics, um, that CPI has already been taken a lead here. Um, but I think overall that thought leadership is a very important dimension of CIPR uh, because we, when we do have a huge number of very senior professionals and I know there are many with us this evening so it's really looking at that strategic area that it's not just a matter of like say just doing digital even if that's, if that's important but we need to see like where is the industry going what are the issues that we need to, need to manage such as ethics in, in AI how does that work well we've now got our first guides to look into it uh, we've also had campaigns such as PRPs, um, talking to different people from different parts of the sector. We had an interesting interview uh, with someone from Heathrow Airport in the UK. Uh, we also have webinars on very high level issues. Uh, one of them is the five things your board wants from PR to say, you know, if you are really at that chartered level, what is it that the board is interesting in? Because you're going to be there with the chartered accountants and other chartered professionals and you have the same value that they do. So, uh, so really CIPR wants to, be, to, wants to be and to remain in this very strategic sphere um, of looking forward in the thought leadership way. So if we can move on to the next slide, Enola. So Influence Magazine Online, I think it was mentioned at the start by Andras, uh, but I mean, this is an excellent publication. It's won a number of awards. And even when it comes to the CPD, there are certain articles on things like how to create your personal brands where you can actually read the article online and you can collect the CPD points for that. So it would actually count towards uh, your own sort of, you know, your CPD development and eventually your own charter status. So again, I think that's a wonderful development that now we have this magazine online um, because it covers all types of fascinating topics from people around the world. So again, it's, uh, it's definitely well worth a read. Okay, so if we move on, I think I'll now hand back over to Graham as our, uh, as our manager of the CIPR membership to explain just a little bit about how the membership works. Thanks, Graham. Yep, thank you, Samantha, for that. Um, yeah, so if this afternoon session has got you thinking about your professional development and your professional journey, um, and you're not already a member, then you really should be thinking about joining the CIPR. And we've got a, um, a joining offer in a moment, which I'll share with you. But first of all, um, membership of the CIPR really is about demonstrating accountability to a third party organisation for your professionalism and your commitment to ethical practice. So um, as part of joining the CIPR, you have to sign our code of conduct, um, which says just that, that you'll behave in a professional and ethical manner at all times. Um, and then you get a listing on our what we call the PR register, which is a publicly searchable list of all our members. Um, and that means that there's a lot of professional reassurance given to the people that you're working with. But if something were to go wrong, there's a complaints process in place. Um, and as I say, you're accountable to a chartered body um, for what you do. Um, and on to the next slide. Thank you. And these are just some of the benefits of membership uh, for CIPR. So everyone has to sign the code of conduct, which gives you a listing on the PR register. Um, every grade of membership, with the exception of our student grade, which is for people studying on a qualification lasting at least 12 months and is available at a highly discounted rate, all of those grades get access to CIPR CPD, which is all of those learning resources we were talking about, together with the way of logging, tracking and recording your development in a structured manner. Um, training discounts, um, you get access as a full member um, to unlimited CIPR groups. So we were talking about all of those sector specific, geographically based groups, CIPR International. As a full member, you get access to all of them. 
Um, we have a global affiliate grade, which is designed for people based outside of the UK, which gives access only to CIPR International Group, which could be very relevant. Um, and at certain grades, you also get to use our member logos and designatory letters after your name, which is, um, again, nice for recognition purposes. Um, and then again, as Darbuni was alluding to, two years of consecutive CPD and you're awarded accredited PR practitioner status, which is one of the two professional accreditations that we provide, the other of which is chartered status. Um, and as a democratic organisation, you can vote in CIPR elections as a full member and get involved in board councils and, and committees. Um, every group has a committee, so each group is led by members for members. And the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have a joining offer, which is valid uh, for a few more weeks. So you have until the 15th of October to take advantage of this. Um, you can join online on our website, cipr.co.uk, um, at affiliate associate member grade. Usually there's a £55 admission fee, um, but if you use this discount code, which is ACW20, we'll waive that as long as you join by the 15th of October. Um, and you can see the fees on there outlined for the various grades. Um, we've also got a, a second offer, which is if you want to join a global affiliate grade, that's normally £87 for the year, and there's never a joining fee at that grade. We can reduce that to £60 for the year until the 15th of October. So again, just use that same discount code, ACW20, join online, um, if you're taking advantage of the second offer, you will need to select pay by invoice uh, because we're manually overriding the price that the system would normally charge you. So um, you have to select pay by invoice, we'll reduce the fees and then you can log in and pay online as normal. Okay, and that's, um, that's the offer. So um, hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavour and got you thinking about membership and, and CPD. Contact me if you've got any questions after this grahamk at cipr.co.uk or find me on LinkedIn. Thanks, Graham. And now over to Annie for the Q&A session. Looks like we lost Annie. <laughs> so, so now we're going to just launch into Q&A. If you've got some questions, you can raise your hands or put them in the chat box. To any of the, to any of the speakers, particularly um, Darbuni. Okay, so while we're waiting for everybody to get, um, okay, so we've got some questions um, from Agatha. Graham, can non-members attend your webinars? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you for that. Generally, the answer is no. Most of our content is for members only. Um, sometimes, occasionally, if there's a particular reason, we may make a webinar available um, to the public at large, if there's a benefit to doing so. So I guess the short answer is it depends on the webinar, but generally speaking, they're all member only. Can I just add as well, um, the, the, as well as the corporate um, webinars done by the Central HQ, there are sometimes um, webinars and panel discussions organised by the groups that people might find useful. Um, so I, I work in governmental public relations and we do discussions and chats and they're fairly low cost to join. Um, they're slightly different, you know, they're much more informal. Um, but, and I'm sure Andras does the same for the CIPR International Group. Yeah, I also just wanted to add that uh, 
as far as I remember, all of our webinars, which we produce the CIPR international uh, groups, are available for everyone for free to visit. So those are not part of the CIPR age guided webinar courses or like video courses, but they are more like networking events and some sort of skills guides. Um, if you check on uh, on our website, we have a doing PR um, a webinar series on specific countries, all available are for free. Uh, we have a Vimeo channel as well, vimeo.com uh, slash CIPR International. And you have a list of around 15, 20 webinars, which are all free. Uh, and also, if you're interested in, in uh, getting in touch with more of our group, we will have our AGM in the 22nd of uh, October. Uh, and that's a webinar with a panel discussion as well on reputation issues. And that, that is going to be free as well for, for everyone to attend. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think next we've got a question from Adedoi Jaisimi about um, what's the difference between the different membership levels, associate, affiliate. I think this is for Graham. Yeah, so there are, um, the seven, there's actually seven different membership grades. Um, essentially, it's about the level that you're operating at within your organization or in your career. So affiliate grade is for people who um, are not necessarily working in a PR or a comms related role, but have an interest in the industry. Um, associate grade is for people who are working in a PR or comms related role, but have less than two years experience. And full member or MCIPR grade is for those who are working in a PR or comms related role and have at least two years experience in the field. So it's a really a reflection of your experience um, and there are different pricing levels to reflect that. Thanks for that, Graham. Um, so if you've got any more questions, please put them in the chat box um, in the, and we can continue to just, yeah, we'll be able to answer them. Well, there's someone raising her hand. You have to look at least raising her hand. So Lakma, did you have a question? Oh, she's on mute. Okay, I have a question for Darbuni. What, I mean, in your experience, what was, what was the most, I would say, most challenging part of the chartership um, assessment of the online assessment? Um, I think it was just that it was a day long, um, even though, though um, CIPR gives you all the tools and, you know, you have all the webinars and, you know, there are lots of resources to support you. Um, you know, just as you go into that space, you're not quite sure the angles the questions will come from and you know you're going to be sitting down, you know, for a whole day and so, and you don't, and you don't know anybody else in the group. I mean, it's very unlikely that you know the other people that are put together with you. So you're really like in a new zone. For me, I didn't know anybody on the panel. I didn't know anyone in my group. So it was really new and fresh and, and a bit scary really um, to start with. But I think going into it, um, in the second stage, you know, you started getting familiar with your group. We formed a little cohort, you know, in my group later on, you know, and then, you know, it, and of course, in terms of the conversation as well, I think everyone participating has a role in making it either a good or a terrible experience. And I was really grateful that all, all of the people in my group, you know, um, who had, you know, fantastic stories and different backgrounds and really supported everybody else in the conversation that we had. So I think it's just that it's in itself the unknown you know <laughs> going stepping into the unknown is the scary part but the known part is fine getting ready and all of that and i think the other thing i would add really is about it's really about a conversation um i think for all of us that have taken part in it it's it's about um your personal experiences and a conversation and so um if you haven't actually had hands-on experiences in the areas of ethics and strategy, which usually comes as a leader in your organization or developing through your career, it'll be very difficult to participate effectively in that. And so um, bringing on that experience, I think far outweighs, you know, the, the theoretic part of the preparation there as well. 
Great. Can, Thank I, can I add just a, 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 two more uh, thoughts on this? Because I, I did my chartership a month ago in, in uh, oh. late August. Yeah. And so I have a recently chartered as well. Uh, two things. One is that um, the day itself, the assessment day itself, is not a test. It's, it's three conversations or four conversations throughout the day. So even though I was, I was as well scared in the beginning, uh, but it was basically not a question where you have to answer and, and there are good or bad answers. It's basically just sharing your experience and, 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 and be participate in a, in, in a conversation. Um, and that's a very important part of it. So it's, it's, uh, you don't have to be scared. <laughs> scared because of this and, and that, that's one thing and the second one is I think at least to me the most challenging part was the preparation itself so it, it was not the day itself but how you prepare and and it was really helpful going through the webinars and going through the handbook which CIPR provided uh, they are excellent materials and they help you and also they, they, they give you some questions to, to uh, prepare and they that through the two, three, four weeks of preparation, you went through your whole, whole career and you ask yourself your own questions and, and, and your own challenges and experiences. So it was basically a learning process for, 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 for everyone, for everyone who just went into the chartership assessment. And can I add as someone who, who only did it, I did my chartership a couple of years ago now. Um, but, you know, I think for all of us, it's, it's, of a learning experience and as Andras says you know you learn so much through the preparation you learn a lot from the other people on the charter day you're with um, and you make some really good connections and it is a bit scary but it is remembering that you you have that experience you have your skills and it's about just um, demonstrating through the conversation how you would approach things and if you do that with confidence that comes across Thanks so much, Mandy. Thank you, Andras uh, Darbuni, for uh, sharing these experiences. Sounds um, really, really, I, I would say, very, very interesting and looking forward to, <laughs> to, to, to taking up this challenge. I think we've got one question from Tulu Lokwe for Graham um, about membership um, in the chat box. Yeah, so uh, the question is, does this mean that once the relevant fees are paid, one becomes part of the CIPR? Um, that's a really good question because there's actually two parts to joining the CIPR. The first is making your payment, but secondly, and probably more importantly, is you need to sign our code of conduct. Um, and the good thing is you can do that digitally online. It's not something you have to physically sign. Um, and it's part of the online joining process as well. So you can do that. So you need to make an application on the website. And as part of that, you'll sign our code of conduct. And then the second requirement is payment. So once those two have been met, then absolutely you'll remember. Great, thanks. <laughs> I've just seen Carrie's response as well, that once you've signed the code of conduct, you are firmly part of our CIPR family. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you have any last questions, um, you can quickly put them um, in the chat box. But really, I have this one is... last oh. question. Ah, Annie has a question. <laughs> um, I know we need to wrap up, but I think that would be a good idea for everyone. I mean, all the speakers we've heard to summarize maybe in one or two lines, you know, the most convincing argument for anyone, any communication or PR professional to join the CIPR. And especially given that we are in Africa, you know, we're um, talking to Africa-focused communication professionals, and some of them, some of us actually, are francophone or lusophone, or not anglophone. At Um, how would you convince um, people who actually speak English and the, you know, the whole training program uh, to join the CIPR? Uh, how would you go about it? What would be your most compelling, convincing argument? Who wants to, who wants to jump on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick us off, shall I? Um, I think it's a bit like if you think about if you had a, a medical problem, um, you wouldn't trust somebody who wasn't a qualified doctor to um, set your leg in plaster or do an operation or take your appendix out. You'd be looking for somebody who had the right level of expertise 
skill, ability, um, and who was backed up by a professional organization if something goes wrong. Um, and it's the same for communications, really. Um, you need to be able to give that professional reassurance um, so that whoever's employing you or working with you can have confidence in, in your abilities. Who's next? <laughs> Mandy, Samantha, Samantha. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Annie. Well, I, mean, I think that this has been a time of the last few months with COVID. It's been a time of tremendous change in so many ways. I mean, I think we've seen the drive towards digital that many of us, including myself, now need to learn much more to get grips with digital in a real, in a real concrete fashion. I think that's the sort of thing where we need to reinvent ourselves in some way. Um, but I think also in terms of the Arab African narrative. Um, that, I mean, for me, what COVID has shown in, in, you know, in many countries in the West, we've seen, you know, we've seen poor leadership, we've seen very poor communication, and that has even cost lives in many countries. Whereas in Africa, I mean, in Mauritius, we had only 10 deaths. I was talking to someone in Senegal recently, they've also been doing pretty well. Um, I mean, I think that the tide has turned in some respects. There are very good case studies in Africa of where things have been done very well, and good communication has played an excellent role in that. So I think that, um, you know, in times of crisis, the communication is absolutely key. And I think now it's going to be about reshaping narratives and, you know, being part of the new conversation. And I think that upskilling ourselves, having those right, school, right, right tools in our toolkits has never been more important. And I think that Africa has everything to gain and the PR professionals within it. Thank you, Samantha. Andras, Mandy, Dabuni. Oh, Mandy. Andras, okay. Yeah, Mandy, raise your hand. Hello. I was going to say, I think, you know, um, COVID has been incredibly challenging for everyone, but, but for PR professionals, it's given us an opportunity to really show the value that we can deliver for our organizations, whether that be uh, internal communications, whether it's uh, protecting our brand and reputation or in the sphere I work in, um, communicating governmental messages. Um, and I think it's given us that opportunity to really talk to senior management and show that we are fellow professionals with all our other co-professionals like lawyers and accountants. And I think it's given us that real opportunity. I have to say I've been so impressed uh, with the communications in Africa, which has in many ways been superior to us in the UK around some certain issues. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, we can all learn from each other. And I think being in a chartered institute together gives us that opportunity to learn and share experience in a safe professional space. Uh, also, my comment would be, um that I, I quite like the idea that the assessment itself and the preparation uh, is very high standard with, CI, with the CIPR. And since uh, we try to declare the public relations as a very strategic role uh, within the business, and the assessment and the whole preparation is focusing on the three main areas of the ethics and the strategy and the leadership, and some people fail during the exam. So not, not everyone can, can make it. So that means that the CIPR recognizes of your experience, of your, of your practice on those three areas, uh, which means that everyone who tries to hire someone with, with a chartered assessment, with the chartered uh, recognition or the chartership recognition, that means that they, they have the experience and they prove that experience on all those three very strategic areas. So those who are chartered can be put in anywhere in the world and doing their consultancy on the highest standards which CIPR just recognizes. And I think that's, that, that's an important part of, of this whole chartership issue. Yeah. I definitely agree with you, um, Andreas, and that's really reaching the highest standard of our profession. Um, and as for me as an individual, I always try to achieve that highest standard and the highest standard always gives you an opportunity to test yourself and to improve yourself. And overarching in terms of who we are as pre art professionals is really ensuring that the conversations we have about relationships with people and industry and the community is positive. And going through CIPR and the processes of CIPR gives you access 
to those resources. But for me, most importantly, um, putting together like minds that are working under a code of conduct. So irrespective of our background, of our moral codes, how we were brought up, what we believe is right or wrong, I think it's very in, in, um, important for every profession to have an aligned code of conduct in which irrespective of where you are, irrespective of where you're operating as a PR professional, you are signed on to that code. And so you have like minds and you're going to have the same positive outcomes despite the fact that you probably have different goals and objectives and purposes across board. So just having that center is like an anchor, I think, that is very important for every profession. And I'm glad that CIPR um, has that. And of course, as professionals, if we honor that, I mean, there's no bound to how far we can go and contribute to the conversation globally. Thank you. There were all all, you know, very different answers to the same question, but all very compelling reasons to join the CIPR. And I'm very glad um, as ACW to, well, to have been able to join forces for this afternoon and to uh, provide a big picture of how we can upskill, and especially with uh, the time that's left for 2020. Um, I'm sure everybody has, you know, different take home messages at least for me, um, I believe we, we still have, you know, there's still, the learning curve is still uh, pretty much out there for, uh, for many communication professionals, including obviously uh, myself. And um, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll definitely think about joining CIPR uh, before next month. <laughs> so thank mm. you. Thank you so much, everybody. This was really, 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 really interesting. Um, it's been a really great learning experience. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 And congratulations, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. I love your journey. I love your, your sharing, really. <laughs>